Let's turn together in God's Word to Exodus 29 tonight. Exodus 29. We're going to read the entirety of that chapter, verses 1 through 46. And you'll find that in your pew Bible on page 69. So Exodus 29, verses 1 through 46. Uh, Exodus 29, uh, beginning in verse 1, where God's Word reads as follows. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp It is a sin offering. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and shall take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces, and wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and its head, and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord." You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and take part of its blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and on the tips of the right ears of his sons, and on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the great toes of their right feet, and throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments, and on his sons and his sons' garments with them, with him. He and his garments shall be holy, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. You shall also take the fat from the ram, and the fat tail, and the fat that covers the entrails, and the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination, and one loaf of bread, and one cake of bread made with oil, and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take uh, them from their hands and burn them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering to the Lord. You shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord and it shall be your portion. And you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved and the thigh of the priest portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination from what was Aaron's and his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel, for it is a contribution. It shall be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings, their contribution to the Lord. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him. They shall be anointed in them and ordained in them. The son who succeeds him as priest, who comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place, shall wear them seven days. You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. 
They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration, but an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh for the ordination or the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Through seven days shall you ordain them, and every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Also you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it, and shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb, a tenth measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and a fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer with it a grain offering and its drink offering, as in the morning, for a pleasing aroma of food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the, tent of, uh, at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So far the reading from God's word this evening. May he add its blessing to our hearts. Well, the text that we have before us this evening is a fairly detailed description of a ceremony. Aaron and his sons are to undergo this ritual that sets them apart for priesthood among the people of Israel. And on the surface, it may seem that this is a chapter that's about blood being shed. And and there certainly is a lot of blood that is shed in this chapter. There's pouring of blood, there's sprinkling of blood, there's there's putting blood on the big toes and the thumbs and the earlobes of Aaron and his sons. There's, There's blood being sprinkled on the altar and the robes. There's blood being poured out against the sides of the altars, and then there's blood being smeared on the horns of the altar, and and you might be able to find some other places and other ways in which blood is used in the chapter that we've just read together. But like all the other parts of tabernacle worship, it is actually not a chapter that's about sacrifices of lambs and goats and bulls. It's not so much something that is about blood spread on toes of men, But rather, this ritual, this ceremony, actually points forward to something far more significant. And what we want to see as we work our way through Exodus 29 is that the priests are consecrated and ordained to lead the people in worship, which actually anticipates the the work of Christ. And so what the priests will do imperfectly in this chapter and in subsequent chapters, we'll see how imperfectly priests do this. What they do imperfectly in this chapter, Christ will do perfectly uh, when he comes. So the priests are consecrated and ordained to lead the people in worship in anticipation of the work of Christ. And to learn that lesson, we want to look at three parts of this chapter. The first one deals with the sacrifice, so we want to understand sacrifices that are being made. Then we want to think through consecration and ordination as one idea, so uh, that's the second point. And then the third point, we're going to tie it all together, bring it all together, and see how Christ fulfills that, uh, the work, of, the work, what is pictured in the priest, how Christ fulfills that work. So we're going to look at sacrifice first, then consecration and ordination second, and then the fulfillment in Christ third. So there, we're going to begin by looking at sacrifice. Now there's no question that when you work your way through this account of this ceremony, this consecration, this ordination of the priests, That sacrifice is central. Uh, After they are washed with water, see that in verse 4, Aaron and his sons 
have various sacrifices that they make at different times throughout this ordination process. They offer up one bull and two rams, along with different grain offerings, uh, which are offered during the ceremony. And then the event itself, the ordination ceremony itself, lasts seven days. And every day there is another bull that is offered on the altar. And you see that in verse 36. And then you have that further description of the daily sacrifice requirements at the tabernacle in verse 38 of these two lambs that are offered one in the morning, one in the evening, every day uh, of the existence of the temple and the tabernacle. Now, in the past, we have certainly looked at sacrifice. We've looked at the quantity of sacrifice. We've seen how many animals were killed at the tabernacle and at the temple. And so we've seen the pervasiveness of the shedding of animal blood at the tabernacle, at the temple, as part of Israel's worship. And we've seen how because Israel's sins are great, therefore the offering for their sins must be great as well. And so because the sins of Israel are many, so the blood shed at the tabernacle must be much. But the principle of sacrifice in this chapter isn't necessarily dealing with the pervasiveness of sin among the people of Israel. It's not primarily even about Israel in this chapter. This chapter is dealing with the high priest and with his four sons and the sacrifices that they must make as part of their ordination, as part of their consecration to uh, the Lord. And so we're not really dealing with pervasiveness of sin so much as we're dealing with the quality of of Israel's priests. And, the, and what we see in these sacrifices, the sacrifices of the bull and the rams and the seven bulls, one offered each day, when we're thinking through the ordination process, the consecration process, we see something immediately about the priests. See, the priests of Aaron were never intended to give the people of Israel some kind of sense that they would fulfill redemption. That somehow through Aaron and his sons, that Israel's sins would be finally removed. Uh, the New Testament interpretation of the high priest of Israel is given to us in the book of Hebrews. And there we see that the final cleansing can only come through Christ. What we see in the ministry of the priest, the high priest and his sons, is an anticipation of what Christ will do. Now, there is a great temptation, especially today in the church, to separate Old and New Testament. To say that Old Testament did things one way, New Testament does things another way, and, and, and so that we create some kind of a chasm between these two parts of God's Word. But the New Testament connects the Old Testament by showing that it all points to Christ, that it is all one book. And that's why the book of Hebrews is so important for us to understand what's going on in Exodus. And by God's providence, we've had significant overlap as, as we looked at those two uh, books together. See, the priest was never anticipated to provide any real cleansing. Their ministry simply pointed forward. And we know that from Hebrews 7. In Hebrews 7 and verse 11, it says, Now, if perfection had been attainable, through the Levitical priesthood, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? So, my friends, when we read the Old Testament, what, what the book of Hebrews is telling us as a commentary on the Old Testament is that God had always intended the priesthood of Aaron to be inadequate. That the priesthood of Aaron was never intended to be the final resting place, the final source of confidence for the people of God. The priests are never presented as being holy in and of themselves, meaning pure. Not meaning set apart, because they were set apart. But they were never pure in and of themselves. They were never presented as sinless. And we see that right here in their ordination. The first thing they have to do as they begin to assume the role of a priest, the office of a priest, is blood must be shed for them. In verse 36, it talks about the atonement that's being made by this bull. Atonement, this uh, making satisfaction to God by offering an equivalent for wrong 
that is done. As the priests are being set apart for the priesthood, blood is shed for them for that purpose, to make atonement, to make satisfaction to God by offering an equivalent for a wrong done. Now, in this case, it is the death of an animal for the life of the priest. The animal dies so that the priest doesn't have to die. The, the animal assumes the consequence that should have been reserved for the priest himself because the priest sinned, and from Genesis 2.17, we know that the day you eat of it, the day you sin against God, the day you transgress against His commandment, that day you shall surely die. And so the priest, just like the people that they would minister to, like them, deserved death. And so the animal stands in his place. And after Aaron and his sons were clothed in the priestly garments, we see that in, in verses 5 through 9, then you have the bull slaughtered at the entrance in verse 10. And the first ram is offered as a burnt offering. It's consumed completely in verse 18. And the second ram, which is the ram of ordination, is made as an offering for purification in verse 21. All throughout the ordination process, animals are dying in place of the priest. Animals are dying to purify the priest. You see, the, the sacrifice right at the beginning of this process points to the inadequacy of Aaron, the inadequacy of his sons to complete what is pictured in their work. They were to be those who were about the business of offering up substitutes for the people of Israel. Their sacrifices offered on the altars to be received in place of the people of Israel. They were never able to complete what they were picturing. Nevertheless, they were men who were ordained for that very task uh, by the hand of God himself. Sinful as they were, God set them apart for this purpose. It is their work to lead Israel in worship as priests. But the sacrifices show us that they are not expected to be able to fulfill what they're picturing. Now, the next thing we want to look at together is their consecration and ordination. And, and they are two related words, but they have two different meanings. So we think about these priests. We've seen from the sacrifices that they're inadequate, but incomplete and inadequate as they were, they were consecrated and ordained by God. Now, each of these words has its own significant in, in significance in the assumption of church office. And both of them inform, uh, inform us as to how Aaron and his sons enter into that office. And it helps clarify that office. So let's think first about consecration. When the Bible uses that word consecration, what's it talking about? Well, in our chapter alone, the word consecration appears seven times, or consecrate, consecrated, consecration, all the forms of that word, seven times in our chapter. Now, three times, it has specifically to do with Aaron. The other four times, it's dealing with other parts of the tabernacle, sometimes the sacrifices itself, the, the altar, or the tent. And consecration is a word that deals with status. From all the people of Israel... You take all the tribes, the two million plus people that came out of Egypt from out of all of those people, God consecrated five, consecrated Aaron and his four sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar, those five. And, and by Leviticus 10, it's going to be three because Nadab and Abihu are going to be slain by God. They're going to be consumed with fire for offering uh, a fire that was not authorized. So out of all those people, five are consecrated. They're singled out by God himself. So another way that you can describe consecration is to say that they were set apart. Remember the golden plate that sits on the turban of Aaron. We talked about it last uh, time we were in Exodus together. You remember what was written, what the inscription was on that plate? Holy to the Lord, set apart to the Lord. It is an indication of consecration. But consecration is not a self-appointed position. In Hebrews 5, again, interpreting the function of the priests, 
and their ordination in Hebrews 5 verse 4 it says no one takes this honor for himself of becoming high priest no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was so he's set apart yes but he's not set apart according to his own choosing he's set apart by God himself he has consecrated a divine appointment of an inadequate man for a holy purpose that's consecration it was part of Aaron's experience as a priest he was an inadequate man he was by divine appointment set apart for a holy purpose but then there's this, there's the second aspect of Aaron assuming the office and that's the aspect of ordination so consecration appears seven times in our chapter not all of them refer to Aaron three of them do ordination that word appears nine times in our chapter in verses 9 22 26 27 29 31 33 and 34 and each time the word ordination is used it always refers to Aaron and or his sons so they are set apart by God's appointment they're consecrated but then they're also ordained for office so so it's not simply a consecration it's not simply setting aside somebody for a specific task if consecration is a word that indicates status then ordin ordination is a word that completes that notion by talking about authority the transfer of authority from one to another so the receiving of special status comes with a transfer of authority from one party to another and that practice still continues today for example when a man assumes church office whether it be for elder or for deacon there is the process of ordination and if you read from the King James Bible in Acts 14 and verse 23 talking about uh, Barnabas and Paul and their labor in the fledgling churches that they were establishing and it says when they had ordained them elders in every church in the ESV it would say when they had set apart I think the word is set apart when they had set apart elders in every church so ordination beginning with the priests of the tabernacle is still being done in the New Testament church so what is ordination what is its function what is its value well when it comes to the offices of the church consecration and ordination go hand in hand and ordination can be seen in scripture when you look for certain key words there's certain words that clue you in into the scripture that an ordination is taking place there is a consecration so there's a setting apart by God's appointment the shoulder it's not talking about that it's talking about the formal process of ordination don't enter into ordination quickly don't be part of the transfer of authority very quickly and, and so consecration ordination the precedent for that is established in the priestly office men are set apart for a specific work among his people by God himself so they're consecrated and that is accompanied by a specific sign the laying on of hands which symbolizes the transfer of the necessary authority and ability to carry out this task as part of their ordination so, so it's a transfer there is a setting apart by God for a specific task and then there is a transfer of authority from God who holds all authority in his church to that man who has been given that specific responsibility in uh, his church but there was never a confidence that the priest himself can accomplish this task yes sacrifice is made for him and yes he is consecrated and yes he is even ordained for that purpose but never was it thought that Aaron and his sons would be the final high priest the one who would perfect the people of God so let's see how all of this is fulfilled in Christ like I said before the necessary commentary for understanding the offices of the priesthood is found in the book of Hebrews and the ordination of Aaron we can see that mirrored in the ministry of Christ so just as Aaron doesn't put himself forward to be priest according to his own desire 
So Christ is also appointed to this task. Uh, We've seen Hebrews 5 and verse 4. No one takes this honor for himself. Because that is true, Hebrews 5 verse 5 also follows and says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but was appointed. Christ was consecrated. He was set apart. That is, of course, the wonder of the relationship of the persons of the Trinity. Now, this morning, we looked at the, person, the three persons of the Trinity. We saw that they were the same in substance, that they were equal in power and glory. And that's the language of our confession when we think of God, the Trinity. It distinguishes them in person, but it says that they're the same in substance, that they're equal in power and glory. And yet, in the midst of that equality, in the midst of that same nature, one God and three persons, the Son submits himself to the will of the Father, not as an inferior or lesser being, but as part of the plan of redemption. Voluntarily, within the persons of the Trinity who remain equal, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, the Son submits himself to the will of the Father. He doesn't do this out of weakness. He doesn't do this out of obligation, but the Son does this voluntarily. Christ, the great high priest, is consecrated, set apart within the persons of the Trinity to be the one who will accomplish redemption for the people of God. Now, there's even a transfer of authority on some level from the Father to the Son. So there's consecration, but there's also, in some sense, ordination. And and I admit that's hard to understand. Uh, If they are the same in substance, equal in power and glory, how how can the Son receive from the Father authority? But that is what the Scripture says. In Revelation 2 and verse 27, uh, as it's thinking about the blessing, um, I forget which church in the letter of the seven churches, uh, but it's talking to one of the churches, and whenever in Revelation they're concluding one of the letters to the seven churches, they they always conclude with this this, uh, incentive almost, where it talks about the one who conquers, to the one who conquers, I will give this, to the one who conquers, I will give give that. In Revelation 2 verse 27 it says, Those who conquer are given authority over the nations. And then Jesus says, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. So uh, even as our heavenly high priest in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ is consecrated, so also he is ordained, and, and in that way he mirrors Aaron the priesthood, but there's one thing that's missing. What is the one thing that's missing in the priestly work of Christ? Christ doesn't offer an animal in his own place for purification. The one thing that is missing is the sacrifice of animals. There's not a sacrifice for the priest, for Christ, because Christ is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Because Christ in his nature is without original sin which would be enough to condemn any priest that ever walked on the face of the earth. There's no sacrifice for the great high priest because he is also without actual sin. Not only is his nature not corrupt, but his practice is not corrupt. And yet, what is central to Christ's priestly work, even though no animals need to be offered for him, even though he has no original sin and he has no actual sin, What marks the priestly work of Christ? His sacrifice. But it's not the sacrifice of animals. It's not the sacrifice of bulls and rams, and it's not the offering of grain offerings. It's His sacrifice. His own body hung on the tree. As all the other priests have done before Him, He also offers sacrifice, but the nature of His sacrifice is is completely different. It's not the sacrifice of animals, which in the Old Testament served as a picture of substitution. And it's not a picture of sacrifice as we see it in Aaron's ordination, which is a picture of substitution. But in Christ, we see the fulfillment of that picture when he offers himself. That's what it says. Again, 
looking at our commentary on the book of Exodus from the book of Hebrews, talking of Christ in Hebrews 7, 27. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. There's the difference. When you come to the greater tent, Christ himself, you will not hear the bleeding of sheep. You will not hear the lowing of cattle. All you will hear is the voice of Christ who says, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's the offering up of his own body on behalf of his people. Christ does what no priest could ever do. All of Aaron's sons and Aaron himself are in the same place. They're all in the condition of sin and misery. And yet Christ is different. He enters the world without original sin. He lives in the world without ever any sinful thought, word, or deed coming across his mind. It's unimaginable to us, but that's how he lived. And yet, 2 Corinthians 5 to 21 tells us, For our sake the Father made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the way of salvation, my friends. You want the righteousness of God? There's only one place to find it, and it's not in the sacrifice of animals. It's not in your own good works. It's found in Christ and Christ only. If you want the righteousness of God, then you must be in Christ. You must be in Him through faith. And the final result of that faith is actually uh, anticipated in some way in our text as well, right at the end in, in verses uh, 45 and, and 46 when it talks about uh, the effect of the sacrifice uh, of these animals. The final result, the consecration, the ordination, the sacrifice are all for a purpose. In verse 45, it serves to reinforce for the people of Israel the presence of God. Uh, the confidence in verse 46 in that relationship grounded in their deliverance from the land of Egypt. And so it is in Christ. His sacrifice is the perfect coming of God who dwelt among us, an enduring confidence that in God we have deliverance, not from a land of physical bondage, but a, a land of spiritual bondage, sin, enslavement to sin. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means that we should trust in nothing, or, uh, nothing else or no one else for salvation except in your great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are all sorts of things that you may set apart to accomplish your salvation. There, there are all sorts of things that you may offer up as sacrifices, trusting in them to bring about the salvation of your soul. It really, the list is too long, right? Uh, Calvin talks about the human heart as being a perpetual factory of idols. Uh, so we're in the idol-making business in our own hearts. So there's too much to catalog all the different ways uh, that we might be engaged in this kind of idolatry, seeking to accomplish salvation outside of Christ. Really, it is whatever you set up in your heart as your final fulfillment, whatever you set up as the place where you think you will find peace. It may be a, a certain financial savings goal. It may be a position at work. It may be a certain standard of behavior in your children. It could be consistency in carrying out what could be spiritual disciplines if you are exercising them by faith. But if you look at these things as the solution to your problem, it would be like looking Aaron to be the one who perfects your soul. All of them are just band-aids. They're just band-aids that are seeking to fix a severed femoral artery. If you think that those things are the solution to your sin problem, you might find some temporary relief there. But in the end, you will have the same sense of guilt. You'll have the same sense of foreboding 
at facing God who avenges, yes, brothers and sisters, who avenges sin. The flow of blood is too great. The band-aid will become filled and, and, and fall away. And so there are all sorts of ways in which we, we look to a false authority to give us some kind of assurance to, uh, to ease our minds, to, to ease our guilt. But it's only in Christ that true forgiveness can be found. And if you listen to another voice, you're listening to, you're listening to a slave master, something that's going to pound you into the ground that will never give you relief. This morning we talked about you know, the proverbial neighborhood playground. I want to take us back there again because when I was growing up, again, in that apartment complex in the Netherlands, we had a unique system. It made us stand out among all the neighbors. I didn't think of it much when I was a child, but looking back of it, the neighbors must have thought that the Americans were a little bit weird. And so when we got sent down outside... My mom didn't bother uh, to set a, tell us, you need to be upstairs at this time so that we can have supper. She had a bell. And when it was time for us to come in, she would just stand on the balcony and, and she would ring this bell. And uh, all the children in the neighborhood knew that when the bell was sounding, hey, Jeff, it's time for you to get home for supper. N now, it wasn't all the time that they were sympathetic or supportive for me obeying the call of this bell, because the bell really was a sign of my mom's authority. The bell really said, Jeff, your mom is calling you to come upstairs. Now, at times, my friends would, would urge me to stay and play. There were competing voices there. The voice of my authority said, this is the way, this is the way that you must walk. And then there were voices in my ear that were saying, no, stay a little bit longer. Stay a little bit longer and play. That's what happens in the world. When we read God's description of a man can be redeemed and, and yet we hear a voice that says, no, peace isn't found in Christ. Peace is found in a better car. Peace is found in a better job. Peace is found in a, in a bigger home, right? All of these things drag us away from the thing that we must follow in order for us to have peace. That's what happens when we allow different parts of our life to take precedence over our trust and faith in God. We listen to a false master, a master who would not deliver us, but a master who would enslave us. There is only one who becomes sin for you. There is only one who lived a perfect life and can stand in your place. There is only one who receives stripes that you may be healed, and he is Christ, and you must trust in him. Aaron and his sons, they're, they're set apart in this chapter. They're ordained for the office of the priesthood. But their offer, office is entered with this ceremony of blood, this sacrifice which shows them that they themselves are inadequate to do the thing that they are pictured to do. They are not the ones in whom Israel should and could rest but another will come after them whose sandals they are not worthy to untie he comes set apart by the father empowered for sacrifice his own sacrifice and that is the priestly work of christ so trust in him today my friends trust in him today that you truly would be delivered from your sin. Let's pray together.